The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. They deserve a vote. They deserve a vote. Tonight on the heels of an electrifying State of the Union address, President Obama prepares to push his anti-violence message right here in Chicago. Plus, stunning and out of the blue, Illinois Lieutenant Governor Sheila Simon changing the face of the 2014 governor's race. Jesse Jackson Jr., his future in jail? Reports continue of a plea deal for alleged corruption that could put him behind bars. And your five-year-old could be headed to school if one state senator has her way. Is that simply too much too soon? These stories and more tonight on In the Loop. Good evening. I'm Chris Beery. And I'm Barbara Pinto. Welcome to In the Loop. President Obama comes here tomorrow to push a national crackdown on gun violence. His visit follows Chicago's deadliest January in a decade, and it comes after a year of incredible bloodshed. More than 500 people killed on the city streets. The president talked about the recent shooting death of 15-year-old Hydea Pendleton in a rare emotional moment in his State of the Union speech. Her death has become a lightning rod in the national gun control debate. Tonight, we take an in-depth look at the epidemic of gun violence in Chicago. Well, I have five children, and already I have three children that have been shot. It's due to um, rap music and, you know, like I said, the video games, the, the Grand Theft Auto and stuff like that. These are things they know. So they, they, they emulate the things that they see. Idea Pendleton was a model student, good grades, active in school. Her tragic death came after the trip of a lifetime for the teenager. Just three weeks ago, she was here in Washington with her classmates, performing for her country at my inauguration. And a week later, she was shot and killed in a Chicago park after school, just a mile away from my house. Idea's parents, Nate and Cleo, are in this chamber tonight. They deserve a vote. They deserve a vote. Hi, my name is Hydea. Five years ago, Hydea recorded this video urging other kids to say no to gangs. This commercial is informational for you and your future children. So, so think smart, but joining the gang isn't, isn't a part of it. Ironically, Hydea's message is now being heard around the world on YouTube. The girl's cousin, Shatira Wilkes, believes Hydea's death will make a difference. It clearly was just time for her to go. And I say that because we've seen so many things take place in her death that could change the world for betterment. President Obama and some Democrats are calling for bans on assault-style weapons and limits on high-capacity ammunition magazines. But even if those bans were in place, they could not have saved Hydea's life. Black boys don't go and use assault rifles. They can't afford them. That little girl that got killed, it wasn't shot with an assault rifle. And I believe that this is a calling that is going to wake up everyone, and this is now. Reporter P Peter Nikias works the overnight crime beat for the Chicago Tribune. On a daily basis, he encounters what life is like on the streets of Chicago. He sees it all and joins us with the backstory. Welcome. Hi. What kind of pressure were police, police under to crack this Pendleton case? It was pretty intense uh, from the jump. I mean, the story came out uh, first. You had a daytime shooting in February, which is rare. You had three young victims. They were all under the age of 17. Uh, the young woman died. Uh, she was 15. Uh, the connection, you know, that she had performed in Obama's inauguration came out pretty quick also. So it was a heater case that the department probably hasn't seen the likes of in at least, I'd say, five years, if not longer. This was an extraordinary girl, obviously, but I, I sense from your reporting that in many ways, it was an ordinary crime. It, I mean, multiple, inc multiple victim shootings aren't, aren't rare in the city at all, especially when it gets warmer out. And it, yeah, you know, teens die on a somewhat regular basis in the city. It's sad, but it, it happens. Yeah, I mean, you, most of the violent crime we see in the city happens after dark on your watch. Uh, take us with you to work. What do you see on a typical night? 
I, I mean, on a typical night, we, we try to visit at least one or two crime scenes. Uh, it's been slower the past couple of weeks, which is great for the city. Um, but, you know, we go to the crime scenes. If, if somebody dies, if the body's still there, usually family shows up. And so you, you try to talk to family and get a sense of who, the, you know, what the person was like, what, even if it's just what they were interested in or how they lived their lives, if they had kids or other family. Um, and try to give more of a complete picture than just saying, the shooting happened here at this time in this neighborhood. So, and sometimes it's all we can get. I mean, we go to a lot of scenes where nobody wants to talk or we can't find anybody. There's, you know, everything's wrapped up, but we, you know, you still make an effort. You cover this night after night. What is the most striking thing about these violent crimes to you as a reporter? I, w I would say how common it is and how, I mean, how people kind of expect it. Um, we listen to scanners a lot. That's like, that's how we pick up a lot of the, the scenes that we go to and sometimes officers will call in shots fired calls and you don't hear any shots fired calls from the neighborhood it's just the officers calling in they call them loud reports because they unless you see it somebody shooting a gun it's not gunfire but they'll, they'll call in these loud reports and sometimes people in the neighborhood don't call them in and you go out there and you talk to people and they can they can say what gang has what block and how they how they represent and how they show their colors and when they do it and what they mean by it and I mean, the people that live in the neighborhoods obviously have them wired. So it's it, the scenes I've been to where I've been the most surprised, I think, is when people can explain to me how the neighborhoods function down to like on a block by block basis. Some so. of the statistics are staggering. I mean, we saw a breakdown of the number of people charged in shootings that were not fatal. Okay. And I think we have a graphic of that we can put up. But 94% um, of the gunmen in shootings that were non-fatal were never charged with a crime. Can you help us understand how that can happen? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, there's a lot of reasons, but um, I think the, the police we talked to overnight, a lot of them would say it's a workload. There's, there's just a large volume of shootings, more than 2,000 last year. I want to say in the 23 or 2,400 range of shooting incidents, that's not the number of people shot. That's just an incident where at least one person was shot. Um, part of it is victims don't always cooperate. Uh, the two shootings last night, there was one at 3 and one at about 5.40. Uh, neither one of those victims cooperated with police. So one this of is them, the, the, the no snitch code on the street. Yeah, like, I mean, and there's a number of reasons. I mean, it could be because you have to live in the neighborhood and you're not going to rat on somebody who you're going to have to face on the block again. Uh, it could be a violation. Sometimes gang members shoot their own for breaking the rules. Uh, it could be that they're going to go back and handle business themselves. The, you know, they're going to handle it themselves. Uh, there's, there's a number of reasons, but... A lot of those cases are uh, without a cooperating victim. Where's the where's detective to go? I mean, they couldn't even nail down the location on one of the shootings last night. Hmm. Uh, he gave a location, but there's no shots fired calls there. None of the neighbors heard or saw anything. I mean, if, if, you're, if your job is to solve that case, where do you go from there? So. But if you look at those numbers, I mean, almost everybody who shoots somebody in the city of Chicago gets away with it. Yeah. It's scary. You think about it, isn't it? I mean... It, but if, if nobody's going to talk, I mean, the flip side is, is you keep letting people who are doing the shooting sort it out amongst themselves, and what you have is situations like the Pendleton case. I mean, and if, you're, if you live in a neighborhood where there's a lot of gangs, you're kind of between a rock and a hard place because you have to live there. I mean, you have to deal with the gangs and the intimidation that comes with it. So if, if you're going to cooperate with police, you open yourself up to that. But if you don't, you know, gang members aren't, aren't marksmen. They don't always hit their targets. So, it, you know, innocent people get caught only you know, because of the circumstance of where they live. Yeah, you brought along some video that you had shot um, yes. in one of your overnights. And I I'm just wondering, in terms of, of Chicago's position when it comes to violent crime, we're mm -hmm. the third largest city. We are. Yet we are ahead of New York and L.A., larger cities, when it comes to violent crime. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that from what you see? Uh, uh, I mean, again, there's a, there's a lot of reasons. I think a lot of police will say that they don't have the ability to clamp down in an area like they used to. And almost every cop you talk to will say they need, they need more bodies. I mean, and you kind of ex you'd expect police to say that, but I think there's, there's certainly a degree of truth there. They don't, they don't have the ability to lock down a neighborhood like they used to. Uh, there's, no, there's no gang hierarchy like there used to be. Uh, we've been to shooting scenes where the residents in the area will say, well... One gang has these two blocks, and the two blocks that you're in right now, that's another gang. And you have another gang when you go the other side of that street for another two blocks. I mean, that two blocks is hardly enough to consider a border between gang territories, right? So you're, you're always going to have these skirmishes 
is essentially what it is. There's skirmishes between groups of armed youth. So because the gang, hier gang hierarchy is, is broken down, you're saying it, it actually leads to more violence. Yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, there's a lot of, and it's not just gang violence, too. I don't want to make it seem like the only people getting shot are gang members, because that's not the case. I mean, clearly, you saw uh, at the end of the last month that wasn't the case, but um, that is, you know, that's a large part of the violence. And gang members shooting people over non-gang business, too. Um, matters of pride, things like that. The city council has now passed uh, the mayor's gun control proposals. Do you see them making a real difference from your vantage point? I, I seriously wonder what type of, whether gun laws will have much of a ch an effect on, on crime in the city. Because people are already carrying guns. I mean, it's obvious. You don't have 2,200, 2,300 shootings a year without people carrying. So I, I'm not certain. I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that definitively. I'm sorry. Peter, great to have you with us. Thanks for your insights. And now it's Thank time you. for our roundtable. to give us their perspective on this week's trending stories, our journalist Bill Curtis, welcome. Lester Coney, the Executive Vice President at Mesero Financial, welcome to you. Thank you. And James Ryan, a Chicago resident and actor, welcome James. Thank you. Gentlemen, I'd like to start with uh, Sheila Simon. A press conference yesterday lasted all of three minutes, kind of a political bombshell. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor said she would be stepping down, not running again, with Governor Pat Quinn. Now. Um, a lot of questions have risen from this. Is she ditching an unpopular running mate, and how might this alter the political landscape in Illinois? Bill, well, in, we'll start with you. In Chicago, you know, we always are a little suspicious that they're really positioning for something else. Mm -hmm. Maybe taking, as she is, she's young enough, uh, she certainly has enough years. She's very smart, though. Her father was very smart. And I tend to think, I know if I were in that job, that I don't want to be governor with a hundred and eighty billion dollar pension problem just around the corner and seemingly insurmountable problems facing him. So maybe she'll just lay out for a while. The name will always be there. But is she also looking at Governor Quinn's poll numbers, which are terrible? The worst in you the know, country, aren't they? Yeah, I, I would say um, the lieutenant governor, I had a chance to, to hear her speak yesterday at United Negro College Fund um, annual dinner for Black History Month. And she sounded as if she is positioning herself more for another opportunity um, statewide. I, I don't think it has really, frankly, anything to do with her, with her trying to distance herself from, from the governor because, um, frankly, the governor um, was instrumental in her being a part of the ticket in the first place um, some years ago. Um, but it's I do still think kind of unusual, though, for a lieutenant governor just to say in the middle of, I mean, imagine a vice president saying, oh, uh, I'm not going to run with you, Mr. President. I, obviously, lieutenant governor uh, is a much less significant job, but it is a little surprising that she's jumping ship now. When you look at, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the poll numbers, with him being the most unpopular governor, um, and this was taken by Democratic pollsters, it kind of is like rats leaving the sinking ship. When you look at our credit being downgraded so many times, so we have the, Illinois has the worst credit rating in the country right now out of all 50 states, and then you have the pension problem that you mentioned, and I don't even think Quinn has even began a touch on finding solutions so that I get the hell out of there also. It's one of those things where it's like, I don't mind him attached to this. You know? I think so the James, question, where does she go? Where, where, well, I think the question is, does the back. lieutenant governor have anything to do with the with the running of the state. So if you're going to say she does, then I mean she have to take part of the credit or part of the blame, if you will, for anything that's positive or negative going on um, in state government. I think most of the viewers out there don't even really understand what the lieutenant governor does. I don't think any of us understand yeah. exactly. <laughs> that's kind of a silent story. <laughs> but it's one of those things where still having your name attached to that administration because when you're running for office, I guarantee you everyone on running against them in you know the primaries mm -hmm. or on the Republican ticket are going to be bringing up well when you were a part of the Quinn administration and pensions hit 180 billion shortfall and you had the credit downgraded to the worst in the country 
They're gonna. What did you do when you were, you know, with this administration? So I think it's That's kind right. of dissing herself for right. a later political run. Which is what Attor attorney general, state controller. Where do, where do you guys see her? Where do we see her? Depends on wherever Illinois well, wants to put her. <laughs> it, it seems like what the attorney general decides to do is going to impact a lot of the other races. And this is Lisa Manikin. Uh, and that's yes. Lisa Manikin. I think once uh, Lisa announced which direction she's going, I think you'll, you'll see a lot of all the other chips fall into, uh, into play. In and maybe Simon is looking at what's coming ahead with the governor's race and seeing a battle between two of the most powerful families in Illinois mm -hmm. politics, the Dailies and the Madigans, and, and wants to stay out of that fight. With, with Pat Quinn caught in the middle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think she could take a vacation for four or five years and still be viable. Yes. She's got a blue she's a young too. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> they're pretty good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, to, we'll, we'll stay in the realm of politics, but uh, Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr., uh, once thought to be an up-and-comer, uh, you know, political icon for a while before he ran into so much trouble, uh, said to have signed a plea deal with the federal government on charges of misappropriation of campaign finance funds. Um, we don't know what is involved in that deal, but uh, what does this say? We have another prominent politician from a political dynasty here in Chicago possibly heading to jail. Well, first of all, I would say it's probably not jail. Um, there are a lot of mitigating circumstances, including his illness. That would be rather cruel to send a bipolar uh, mm -hmm. person to jail. There's no victim here. Um, he'll have to make restitution, so um, they'll let him go his way without a future. What is he going to do now? That's just a guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other reason, he's not in the political climate of Chicago where a U.S. Attorney's Office was trying to make an example of corrupt politicians. And I would agree uh, with Bill, and I'm hoping uh, Bill is correct about no jail term because, you know, the Jackson family, particularly being um, African American, they have been really, uh, my whole life, the most prominent um, family who has tried to su um, support our community. And the thing that disappoints me is to see um, Congressman Jackson have to go to jail over a Rolex watch, which makes no makes no sense to me. I know, and so I haven't seen the plea deal, so I don't know all the details, but Reverend Jackson, the, the dad, have, have been supportive of our community whenever we were in need, and I just feel bad that we're not able to support their family right now while they're in need. So for me, I hope that the um, junior gets a judge that will recognize um, all the work and all the pain that he's already suffered and don't feel like he needs to suffer more by going away um, to prison. This, of course, has had a larger impact already. Uh, Jesse Jackson's wife, Sandy, mm -hmm. uh, Chicago Alderman, she stepped down. He's left his, his congressional post. What does this do to the legacy of one of the most prominent families in Chicago? Well, isn't that why they discussed him possibly having jail time? Is because he'd also be essentially taking the fall for his wife. You know, because she was receiving $5,000 a month from him as a consultant. And when we say there's no victims, maybe no one was physically harmed during this. But when you talk about, you know, the African-American community, when you look at role models, something that in the earlier segment we talked about all the gang violence and things like that, you need younger people to have more role models like that, like the president that, that they can look up to, Jesse Jackson Sr., Jesse Jackson Jr. And then they're seeing these things. I think, not to mention that all the money that is given out is from the constituents. I think that they're... It's doing a lot more damage than we, we, we think by just brushing this off, saying, oh, no one got hurt, so I hope he doesn't have any jail well, time. I 100% disagree with that, only um, from a standpoint that, you know, there's a lot of pain and suffering that already has, uh, has taken place. And so I feel that the Jackson uh, family, you know, when you talk about taking a fall, um, you have to, again, you know, he's served this con con country in Congress for over 15 years. And I, for one, am not a person that feels that when something happens, all of a sudden, everything that you stood for your whole career, all of a sudden is out the window for this one incident. And again, I have yet to see the plea deal, so it's hard for me to Good argue point. what's right or wrong because I haven't seen the deal. But I, I definitely don't think that whatever junior, whatever penalty he, he suffers has nothing to do with his wife. Um, I think whatever penalty he suffers will have to do with what he has encounter and not because he's taken a fall um, for uh, former Alderman um, Jackson. Another, another hot button item this week from uh, State Senator uh, Kimberly Linkford, Lightford, mm -hmm. who wants uh, children to go to school mandatory uh, beginning at age five, and that's changing from uh, age seven. This was really buzzing on talk radio uh, 
this week. What's your sense, uh, Bill, of, of this mandatory step for all children in Illinois to have to go to school at age five? I would do it. Um, you know, schools have become more than just uh, places to educate. They've become, become places of security. You have uh, single mothers mm -hmm. who need to go to work. They need mm -hmm. some place to take the children. Mm -hmm. We don't have the Head Start program anymore, a magnificent program. Sometimes mm -hmm. children would have the only meal of the day there. It seems to me that uh, this is one way to kind of restart it. And then you have the truancy problem. Mm -hmm. A truant officer <laughs> will, will be able to visit maybe mm -hmm. five kids. He may have 100 or 200 on his list that he never gets to. Mm -hmm. So we almost don't have any uh, a truancy program. Anyway, so that's my vote. But is, it, yeah. is, this a, is this a big brother thing? That's what a lot of the people calling into the talk shows were saying, that this is government one more time encroaching on what I should do with my child. Well, I think when, I, when you look at the standardized testing now, um, the standards have, have increased. And you used to have here in Chicago where 80% of our students were passing that test, now it's dropped all the way to 60, 62 percent, and that's because it's a lot more rigorous. So I think, what are we going to do to help these students um, do better on those uh, on those tests? And I think, I think starting early is definitely not only a way to help educate our kids, but also it's a way to help fight crime. A lot of people don't realize, but education and poverty. Is, it drives a lot of the crime that we're seeing today. So when your earlier segment talking about gun violence, you know, this is all a part of it. These, are, these things are not all separate. These are all, all three of these issues um, tying together, education and poverty coming out of our community. Yeah, we, we, we live in a different world here on the south and west sides of Chicago. We have to face that. Mm -hmm. the, the rules everywhere else in the country do not apply. Mm -hmm. There's no social structure. You have no fathers here. Mm -hmm. You have uh, probably absent pastors, mm -hmm. teachers, coaches. Mm -hmm. None mm -hmm. of the structural things that helped us grab the ladder to get out of our communities, mm -hmm. whether in the rural or the city. They're left to gangs. Mm -hmm. And that, to Les's point, is mm -hmm. what, what's wrong with starting their education two years earlier? Mm -hmm. Every parent, I, I can't imagine a parent saying, I don't want my child being educated mm -hmm. at the age of five. You probably shouldn't be a parent. This is one of those things right. where right. Mm -hmm. every parent should want their child to be educated. Mm -hmm. And back to your, what you were saying, mm -hmm. with these kids in school, giving them more of a hope for the future at a younger age, it That's right. puts something... Like they have something they can be, something they can work for, mm -hmm. as opposed to just seeing all the other, the gang violence and joining a gang, join a team. Like, you know, fifth grade or five years old, six year old, seven year old. I just can't imagine kids not being in school at five years old. All right, we move I on agree. to a much lighter topic. Mm -hmm. uh, city council yesterday imposed an ordinance that will fine people up to a thousand dollars for open container laws during the Southside Irish Parade, the Pride Parade, trying to cut down on drunken, disorderly conduct. Um, your thoughts on this? Is it embarrassing that we need to legislate this? <laughs> I, you know, for me, I have not had the pleasure of attending a parade yet. Each year I say I'm going to go because I like to just see firsthand what goes on and, and maybe have a little green beer while I'm out there. But, but you I, be careful because they're going to be looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> but you're feeling within so many feet I, of the parade. It's sad that not only did do I, I think I read where it's not only a fine, but also possible um, jail time up sure. to 20 days, I think, um, depending on. I just think now that's going too far. I mean, for a person who had a beer in a certain area, that now you're going to put them in jail, and that is now on their record um, for the rest of their lives. So I guess I'm, I, you know, I understand the residents who live in that area. Um, that's something that they, a concern that they have. But I think it's going a bit too far with the penalties that we're imposing. Oh, right. I Happy wish we had St. more Patrick's time. Yeah, yeah. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I think yeah. right. the Irish will be able to overcome any law that is passed <laughs> against drinking. <laughs> you heard it here first. Thank you, Bill Curtis. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Les. James, we appreciate your time. Now, if you ever wondered what makes a Chicago hot dog a Chicago hot dog, it all has to do with what you put on it, or rather, what you don't. That's what people are pondering in tonight's Curious City. A special feature we'll bring you each week from our partners at WBEZ Radio. I didn't see you there. 
Hi, I'm Quinn Ford. I'm a reporter. So the short answer is no one knows for sure. I spoke with Bob Schwartz, who's the VP of Vienna Beef. He's been there for 35 years. And uh, he also wrote a book, um, Never Put Ketchup on a Hot Dog, so he's an authority on the subject. I caught up with Bob at Herm's Palace, one of the famous hot dog joints he mentions in his book. And he said the Chicago-style hot dog started during the Great Depression as an inexpensive way to get all your food groups into the same meal. Here's what Bob says. Basically, you had your salad, and you had your meat, and you had your bread, and all of this for about a nickel. That was the banquet on a bun. Now, the Chicago-style hot dog, uh, of course, includes seven ingredients. That's mustard, onions, relish, peppers, tomatoes, celery salt, and the dill pickle, but why no ketchup? Bob says the most common explanation is this. Early hot dog vendors say the taste of ketchup overpowered everything else. When you go to Gibson's for a steak, you don't put steak sauce on that. You want to taste that steak. And when you come to Herm's, or Poochie's or any of those other famous places and you want your hot dog, you want to be able to taste the hot dog and the bun together. That's why they use a steam bun and ketchup doesn't, doesn't cut it. Another great Chicago mystery solved. Before we close this week's show, we're excited to be hitting a milestone here. This month, WYCC PBS Chicago turns 30. Here's a look back at our evolution and what started off as a small community college TV station. Oscar Shabbat was chancellor of the City Colleges of Chicago, and there had been a consortium of universities and colleges in Illinois that tried to get, at the time, WXXW, Channel 20, on the air, and they couldn't do it. So Oscar Shabbat said, give this to the City Colleges of Chicago. We will get it on the air. What happened was, it had been WXXW 20. We changed it to WYCC. We are your City Colleges. Channel 20 first went on the air at 5 p.m. February 17th, 1983. I'll tell you how small we were. We had a cafeteria table for, for a console. The main monitor for our air was on top of the refrigerator. It was small. Basically, we were the little station that could. We were one of the six stations in the country that was just an educational PBS affiliate. When I first started, there were a lot more TV college courses on our schedule than there are today. About 10 years after we first went on the air, we began to uh, produce local programming. Absolute Artistry, which was an arts and entertainment pr program. We produced shows like uh, Small Talk for Parents, Ben Around Town, starring Ben Hollis, creator of Wild Chicago. WYCC has seen tremendous growth over the years, and while we're proud of our past, our future looks very bright. What we've done is try to rebrand and relaunch WYCC to meet its potential. We are creating partnerships with the Old Town School of Folk Music to create a music program. We've created partnerships with the Chicago Sinfonietta. Uh, we've done a documentary, an award-winning documentary on the Chicago Sinfonietta. We, of course, are producing a public affairs program in the loop uh, and looking to do more programming that not only plays here in Chicago, but raises our profile on a national uh, PBS distribution level. Congratulations Channel 20 WYCC for 30 years. Congratulations WYCC on a great 30 years. Congratulations WYCC on turning 30. Congratulations. The conversation continues right now on WYCC.org. Thanks for joining us. You are now in the loop. I'm Barbara Pinto. And I'm Chris Bury. Good night.